show starts right now. Investigators looking into an early morning fire at the former SAISD headquarters. What the San Antonio Fire Department says happened. Plus, so much gunfire around the country overnight, including a situation in North Texas that ended with three teenagers dead and a fourth in critical condition. These stories and more ahead in your morning headlines. But for now, good morning. It is 8.58 this morning. It is December 28th. 28th. All Tuesday. right. And it's also Tuesday for those that are off this week. I, I know. Like, I'm in my sweatpants. I've eaten too much cheese. What day of the week it is. That yeah. was oddly specific. <laughs> Have you had this situation before? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> Katie, but what's not uh, helping is the uh, weather is oh, just the same. Bless. It's I know. The last like seven days. <laughs> I know. That doesn't help us to distinguish one day from the next either. It's still gray out there this morning, and we're really not going to see much change for the rest of the work week. I'll go ahead and kind of get that out of the way, or for those of you that are off, we're really not going to see much change until the weekend after the new year. But the strong cold front we've been talking about, it is still on track. It's still in the forecast, and I will detail that for you coming up in a bit. If you're hoping for colder weather, that's going to be some good news. Let's start with the not good news. Today's pollen count, mountain cedar, very high today with a count of 21,500. This could easily end up being one of the highest counts of mountain cedar that we see all year. The highest count we saw last year was also around 21,000. And the highest count that we recorded um, was back in 2018, and that was a count of over 30,000. So. Mountain cedar, big issue today. It'll probably be giving some folks some trouble, and I am sorry about that. Molds are down from where they were yesterday. They are moderate with a count of 940. So we got the bad news out of the way. Um, the not so bad news is that, yeah, it's another cloudy morning, but we'll see the sun this afternoon, and that will help to warm us up probably about 10 degrees more than where we are right now. A lot of us will top out near 80 this afternoon. More on that cold front, a sneak peek of your New Year's Eve and New Year's Day forecast will be along in just a bit, guys. All right, Katie Blake, thank you so much. Taking a live look out at Transguide. It's been pretty calm and quiet throughout the morning. A lot of people on the roadways. We know a lot of families, a lot of kids on holiday break. So if you are out and about, make sure to drive safe, buckle up, be smart. But for now, 9 o'clock this morning, 68 degrees. Let's take a look at today's 9 and 9. Officials say more kids are being hospitalized with the Omicron variant of COVID-19 nationwide. On average, pediatric hospitalizations are up 35%. In just the past week in Houston, Children's Hospital say they're getting ready for more kids with COVID to fill up beds. The CDC is shortening the recommended time that people should isolate after a positive COVID test. The agency reduced its recommendation from 10 days to five days, but only if you don't have symptoms and you wear a mask for an additional five days. The CDC says the change is motivated by science, showing that transmission usually occurs in the first few days before and after symptoms appear. 96 NFL players tested positive for COVID-19 on Monday. That's on top of 10 positive tests over the weekend. The NFL also announced a booster mandate for all eligible NFL League office staff, as well as club tier one and two personnel. That mandate will be extended to members of the media covering NFL games next month. Apple temporarily closing its New York City stores due to the increase in COVID cases. The company says it has closed 16 stores across the city to in-person shopping. Customers can still place orders online and pick up their orders at the stores. Apple has also temporarily closed stores in five other locations, including in Texas. Hundreds of people told they did not have COVID-19 now have discovered they do after an Australian testing center admitted it sent out incorrect results. Over 900 people were told their test was negative, but turns out the testing company never completed the process to determine if the test was negative or positive and sent out results anyways. The company says it was human error, blaming a transition from an automated system to a manual system. You'll be paying more for many items at the grocery stores next year. Prices set to rise on everything from mac and cheese to mustard, from juice to jello and even canned soup. Analysts estimate prices will rise 5% in the first half of 2022. It's part of what businesses and economists are calling the highest inflation in decades. 
Prices are also expected to rise for rental cars. Travelers already seeing higher rates, longer waits, and fewer choices at rental lots. The travel company Kayak finds the average daily rental rate in December was $81, up 31% from last year. The spread of the Omicron variant complicating the picture with many people ditching air travel and renting cars instead. In New York City, final preparations are underway for the New York City Eve ball drop in Times Square. Workers are checking each of the 32,000 LED lights in the 12,000 pound crystal ball. This year's crowd in Times Square limited to just 15,000 people, all of which are vaccinated, all required to wear masks. The Batman has a new trailer. The upcoming film starring Robert Pattinson as Batman and Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman shows Batman trying to defeat the Riddler, played by Paul Dano. The movie hits theaters in March next year, and that's today's 9 at 9. And there's a lot going on in and around San Antonio. Top stories we are following today, multiple overnight shootings happening around the Alamo City. We start with a terrifying situation at a public park on the city's south side. Two people in the hospital right now and police are still looking for the shooter. Police were called out to the 300 block of Phelps Boulevard just before two this morning to Kingsboro Park. That's where they say two teenagers were shot from behind. Police didn't say if they if the teens were running away or if someone snuck up on them, but one teen was shot in the back of the head. The other was shot in the back. Both teenagers taken to BAMC. Now the victim shot in the head is in critical condition. The other stable this morning. Police continue to search for the shooter or shooters. Officers on the scene saying the getaway vehicle is likely a black Kia Soul that sped off around 1:45 a.m. Also new this morning, San Antonio police say a man was shot in front of his apartment during an apparent drug deal. So take a look. This was a situation around 1030 last night. This is the 4000 block of Horizon Hill. It's near Callahan Lestee's northwest side. Police on the scene telling us the man was taken to the hospital in critical condition. SAPD says a bullet actually went through a window of one of the nearby buildings. Luckily, no one was hurt in that apartment. So far, police have not yet said if there was a suspect found. And also new this morning, the San Antonio Fire Department called out to put out a fire at a former SAISD headquarters. It happened at one of the mobile classroom units. The fire department says a couple of homeless people may have played a role in the fire. You can see part of the outside is charred, but not a lot of damage. The fire chief says drugs may have also been involved. Upon their investigation, they found a couple of cracked pipes there, some balloons and some butane cans and some half cut cans that the folks are using to cook their drugs in. And so that kind of led and that's all in that little area in the corner where the fire started. Authorities were not able to find the people in the area. The battalion chief on the scene also says the Pearl bought this piece of property from SAISD. Pearl representatives say that this is not the first time they've had situations like this. Luckily, no injuries reported. Now to the latest in the pandemic. We're keeping a close eye on COVID cases here in Bear County. Here's the latest numbers from the Department of State Health Services. Important to note, this is State Health Services. This is not Metro Health. The state counts both confirmed and probable cases. It's reporting 957 new cases, 259 people in the hospital with 81 in the ICU and 37 on ventilators. Metro Health will go back to reporting on Monday. Meanwhile, a shortage of at home testing kits creating a bit of a bottleneck for those who gathered socially over the holidays and need to know their status before returning to work or returning to travel. Websites and stores are reporting supply chain and distribution issues, getting those kits stocked on store shelves. That's resulted in long lines for in person testing and appointment only sites say they are all booked up. It's a development that worries healthcare providers. It's very frustrating, particularly now since you know, the recommendations are probably um, more uh, frequently uh, that we should be testing even than previously because that offers some useful information. And there's another shortage as well. The state has run out of a specific monoclonal antibody, the only one that has proven effective against the Omicron variant. It's another distribution issue that may be cleared up in a few weeks, but for now, those with appointments for treatment will be contacted for rescheduling. Well, in the midst of all this negative news surrounding COVID-19, there are some positive stories like this one. Volunteers from across the globe coming together to create one of the largest supercomputers in the world. One that may hold the answers to Alzheimer's disease, cancer, muscular degeneration, the Ebola virus, and yes, even COVID. 
Ursula Perry introduces us to some of these citizen scientists. They're joining computer geeks, school kids, gamers, and pro athletes using their personal computers to get the root of the problem. Greg Bowman is the man behind one of the largest computer crowdsourcing networks called Folding at Home. He's looking to cure diseases, including his own. My interest in proteins really stems from a childhood experience of losing most of my vision to a juvenile form of macular degeneration. Bowman's eyesight has been fading since second grade. Although legally blind, Bowman is studying proteins, something so small that nobody can see them. These are the molecular machines that perform most of the active processes associated with life. Breaking down a single protein can take even the most complex computers a lifetime. So from his office at Washington University, Bowman is using millions of computers around the world to do the work. What we've done is devised ways to break these essentially intractable problems up into completely independent pieces that we can send out to many thousands of people to run in parallel. Folding at Home aims to understand how proteins move and fold into their proper shapes to keep our bodies running. Four million people from every country in the world are helping, though, to find the answers. It's kind of like a synergy, like each on their own independent wouldn't be able to achieve what they could achieve when, you know, working together towards the same common goal. The more computers you contribute, the, the better, but anyone can help accelerate the simulations that we're performing. Many large corporations are jumping on board and helping out with this project. They include Microsoft, Amazon, Oracle, Cisco. They're all using their computers to fold. And in doing so, they're creating more raw computer power than 500 of the biggest supercomputers in the world combined. If you would like to join in, this is the website to sign up on foldingathome.org slash start folding. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Time now, 910, 68 degrees out. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, the Islamic Center of San Antonio speaking out one week after the disappearance of three-year-old Lena Kill. How the Islamic Center is helping in the search. But first, a fiery scene in California. The remnants of a passenger plane crashing into a neighborhood overnight. The latest on the investigation and why one witness says there's a silver lining in the tragedy. This essay salute holiday greeting is brought to you by the Republic of Texas Window Company. Hi, I'm Dana Townsend with Republic of Texas Window Company. My family and I would like to wish the veterans and first responders a very happy holiday. In your morning headlines, multiple deadly shootings overnight, including one in North Texas. And could gas prices hit $4 across the country? A new study says yes. We're going to get to that in just a few moments. But first, we start with this story out of Garland, Texas, right outside of, a, of Dallas. A warning, this may be difficult for some of our viewers to watch. So this is newly released surveillance camera footage showing the moments a convenience store turned into a murder scene. The shooter? a 14 year old boy. Garland police say the teen killed three other teenagers and injured a fourth. All three victims between the ages of 14 and 16 years old. Investigators say the shooter fired at least 20 rounds into the store. Police are searching for a second suspect who they say left the scene in a white truck. You can see it in the video. Investigators are not sure if the teen knew his victims. They are still unsure of his motive. And another shooting to tell you about a horrific night finally over in Denver, Colorado. Four deadly shooting scenes across the city all happening on the same night by who police say the same gunman. Police say the first shooting happened late last night and as they investigated that scene, they were called to another then another. Police say when they finally caught up with the suspect, he led them on a chase, started shooting at officers. He was eventually shot and killed by police. One officer is among the injured. He's in the hospital undergoing surgery in total. Right now we know four people dead, at least three others injured. It's a tough day um, for the Lakewood police family. Um, obviously, when this happens to one of our own, um, last we heard, our agent uh, is in the hospital undergoing surgery. Uh, we do not have any details beyond that. We cannot lose sight of the victims in this, the people that are still fighting for their lives, including a Lakewood a agent. And speaking of those victims, none have yet been identified. Neither has a suspect and still no word on the motive behind the shooting spree. All right, we're taking you to San Diego, California now. A 
trail of fiery debris was caught on camera overnight. Officials say around 7 last night, 911 dispatchers got multiple reports of explosions in one neighborhood. Turns out a passenger plane crashed, hitting multiple power lines on the way down. The plane did not hit any homes and no bystanders were hurt. Investigators say because of the intensity of the flames, they aren't sure how many people were inside the plane. There were no injuries or uh, further fatalities on the ground. Uh, okay. The only fatalities we're assuming right now are those that were in the aircraft, and we don't know how many there were in the aircraft. One of the witnesses saying that she thinks that there is a silver lining in the tragedy. She says the pilot of the plane that crashed was a hero in her eyes because that pilot avoided hitting any homes. Switching gears now, a new consumer report says gas could hit nearly $4 a gallon. This report from GasBuddy.com was just released this morning. The gas price tracking company is predicting the national average will rise to $3.41 a gallon from this year's average of $3.02. GasBuddy believes prices will peak in May at an average of $3.79. So the company is basing this forecast on low oil production from OPEC and refinery closures because of COVID. On the flip side of this report, the federal government and a lot of Wall Street analysts are predicting the opposite of GasBuddy. They are forecasting prices will continue to drop in the new year of 2022. And speaking of forecast in 2022, it is 68 degrees at the end of December. It seems warm, Katie. It is a little wonky, but first we looks like we do have an incident at 35 in Maine. Uh, just a little bit of traffic build up this morning at that time. If you're in that area, it looks like two of the lanes, two or one of the lanes there are closed down. They're forcing people to exit 35 southbound at Maine near the downtown area. If you're in that area, be safe. All right, now Katie Blake. <laughs> Hello. Yes, uh, closing out 2021 and the first day of 2022 will still be warm. But by January 2nd, it will be much cooler. Okay. Much cooler. And yes, 68 at this time of day, at this time of year is warm. This is where we would be in the, in the afternoons. Our average afternoon high is 63. So this is even a little warm for that. So no, it's not, not just you. It's a little warm. Uh, let's look at yesterday's high temperatures. Another big spread because of the cloud deck as it kind of eroded. Some spots saw sun earlier and that helped to boost temp. So 86 in Catula and Pleasanton. Meanwhile, 77 yesterday at the airport and a few 60s from Eagle Pass up to Kerrville. We'll likely see another spread in high temperatures today because we will have another low deck of clouds out there slow to clear up as we head into the afternoon. So generally upper 70s for those that stay under the clouds a little bit longer. Those that clear out sooner could easily jump into the low to mid 80s. We will see mostly sunny to partly sunny skies this afternoon. A few more high thin clouds will be out there today streaming in from the southwest after we lose these low clouds as they start to burn off over the next few hours. Still 68 at the airport. That's where we've been for the past couple hours. 87% humidity. Winds are out of the south southwest at just about 5 to 10 miles per hour. There hasn't been really any fog at all around San Antonio or Bear County, um, and things have been good up I-35 to New Braunfels in San Marcos as well. The fog today this morning has been uh, at its most dense off to the west of the I-35 corridor, and that's where we still have a little bit of lingering patchy fog, but even that will continue to clear up over the next couple hours. 63 currently in Del Rio, 66 Hondo, 72 in Gonzales. So yes, unseasonably warm for this time of day, and this time of year. Our visible satellite picture is coming into view now that the sun is up and there are our clouds uh, almost kind of draped along the I-35 corridor, not as cloudy down to the southeast of San Antonio. And this low deck of clouds is what will start to burn off as we get closer and closer to lunchtime. Looks like there's a little bit of light rain across East Texas, but a lot more precipitation uh, up a little bit closer to uh, the Great Lakes here. There's Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Louis. We've got a very cold rain here changing over to frozen precip precipitation across parts of uh, of Iowa and Illinois. So messy weather there, much quieter here at home. We actually do have a low pressure system and a cold front off to our north. This is not the strong front that will cool us down for the weekend. That is still way up to the north and several days away. But what I want to point out here is this yellow line, and this is called a dry line, and it separates very muggy air from very dry air. The muggy air is on the east side, and the dry air is on the west side of the dry line, and we are sitting in a very muggy air mass today. 
it will stay in place for the rest of the day today and through most most of the day on Wednesday. But watch what happens as we get into second half of the day tomorrow and even into Thursday. This dry line will try to drop down across the area, but it will stall out. So it's not going to be able to clear the entire area. This will basically just result in a spread in our dew point temperatures on Thursday, beginning late Wednesday into Thursday, anywhere from probably the 30s to some folks still stuck in very muggy air with dew points in the 60s. So some of us likely along and north of Highway 90 will get a brief break from the humidity on Thursday. However, it will shoot right back up by New Year's Eve on Friday. So Friday will be a warm and muggy day. Dew points drop again, even more so for everyone by the weekend behind our strong cold front, we'll have dew points in the teens behind this front. So a very dry, also a very cold air mass moving in after the new year. So late in the day, Saturday, so late New Year's Day, Saturday evening, this will move through, bringing with it a colder air mass. We go from low 80 Saturday afternoon to the 50s on Sunday afternoon. So don't totally pack away your jackets just yet. I promise you will need them again just not today. We'll go near 80 this afternoon. The skies start to clear. That cold front is there and our forecast confidence continues to grow that uh, by January 2nd, things will be a bit chilly outside, guys. All right, Katie Blake, thank you so much. 922, a warm 68 degrees out. Still ahead on GMSA at 9, how celebrities and actors are remembering popular and well-known Hollywood director. That's next. Welcome back. New details this morning about an award-winning Hollywood director who suddenly passed away at just the age of 58. We're now learning about his cause of death. ABC's Rhiannon Alley has the details. This morning, tributes pouring in for Emmy Award-winning director Jean-Marc Vallée. Sometimes I'm just holding on to this idea of perfection. Vallée, known for directing the I'm HBO series Big Little Lies, as well as the 2013 film Dallas Buyers Club, passed away over the weekend at the age of 58. A representative for the director saying the cause was a heart attack. Valet was found Sunday at his cabin in Quebec, Canada. It's believed he died on Christmas Day. His death coming as a shock. The director was known as a health enthusiast who was said to have abstained from drinking and exercised frequently. He was also known to have practiced the health and wellness technique known as the Wim Hof method, which uses specialized breathing exercises and exposure to frigid temperatures aimed at boosting energy and the immune system. I gotta, I gotta soothe the hospital to get my medicine. Some of Hollywood's biggest names are posting heartfelt tributes. Matthew McConaughey, who won an Oscar for his work under Valet's direction in Dallas Buyers Club, posting this picture with the words, with a gentle hand and heart, Jean-Marc was a true receiver. And Reese Witherspoon posting this moving tribute, saying, I will always remember you as the sun goes down. I love you, Jean-Marc, until we meet again. Even Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau posting a tribute saying, Jean-Marc Vallée's passion for filmmaking and storytelling was unmatched. So, too, was his talent. Rhiannon Alley, ABC News, New York. All right, time now, 927, 68 degrees out. Coming up on GMSA at 9, KSAT Explains team has details on how the Texas Biomedical Research Institute was involved in the study of COVID-19 vaccines and what else the research center is used for. Plus, it's a food truck designed to give families access to healthy food. Coming up, details on this unique program. Still no sign of this three-year-old girl who disappeared from a playground right outside a northwest side apartment complex, and she was last seen last Monday. Lena Kill's family and the local Islamic community are praying for her safe return. Jaffney Cray caught up with the leaders of the Islamic Center of San Antonio, which has been in close contact with Lena's family. Still being considered a missing person because they don't have any uh, any firm evidence that it was an abduction. It's been a week since the disappearance of three-year-old Lena Kill. Literally. Uh, 
Lena's parents reported her missing Monday evening after she vanished while at the playground of the Villas del Cabo apartment complex on the northwest side. This incident that happened with little sister Lena, this is a first for this community. It's, we've never been touched like this before, and so I think that this is uh, this has energized everybody. It's made us all come together. Since her disappearance, multiple prayer vigils have been held in Lena's honor, including one that took place last Friday where San Antonio Police Chief William McManus and the FBI attended to give an update. The next Next night, Lena's father spoke at a prayer held at the Islamic Center of San Antonio. He thanked the community for everything they're doing, for the generous reward that's being offered, and he also asked us, you know, from the bottom of his heart to, to continue to pray for his daughter and for his family. Community Outreach Representative Michael Martin says that they are also praying that someone comes forward. Anybody that has seen anything, heard anything, knows anything, even if they think it's probably not very uh, significant. We have to pass that forward to the police and to the FBI and let them make the decision. The reward for information has gone up to $150,000 against San Antonio police asking anyone with any information to contact their missing person unit. That number is 210-207-7660. Japhne Gray, KSAT 12 News. We're well, taking a live look out at the Alamo City, 68 degrees. Seemingly unseasonably warm out there. It's yep. yucky. It's humid and yeah. Is that a meteorological term? Yucky? Oh, yeah. I use, yucky. Throw it in the graphic. <laughs> I use gross all the time, uh, especially when the humidity is high. So, yeah, yucky works, I think. For sure. Uh, uh, yeah, it's gray. Another gray start to the day. Thankfully, we didn't have a lot of dense fog set up around town this morning, so that helped us out uh, with the commute, but it is definitely still humid. Uh, with some low clouds around these clouds cover all of Bear County. They extend up into Comal County, Guadalupe County, uh, across a portion of the hill country too. cloudy at Bernie stage with a temperature of 63. Also overcast in Castroville and you there in Castroville are at 70 degrees. In case you missed it earlier, the pollen count mountain cedar very high today. This is our highest count so far this season, and it could end up being one of the highest counts we see all year. So just brace yourselves for that if you haven't been outside just yet. Molds are moderate today with a count of 940. Early look at your New Year's Eve forecast. Friday evening, Friday night temperatures in the 60s, partly cloudy skies. Rain will not be an issue for any fireworks shows, but we will have sort of a mixed bag of cloud cover, a few lingering low clouds and then some mid and high level clouds around as well. South winds will be light, but it will be fairly humid Friday night and for a portion of the day Saturday. Also warm for New Year's Day, but things change in a big way by Saturday evening thanks to a strong cold front. We'll take another look at that and how it will shake up our weather for the first few days of 2022 coming up later on this half hour, guys. Taking a look outside with Transguide, looks like there's still a little bit of an issue going on at I-35 southbound at Maine in the downtown area. However, earlier when we took a look at this, maybe about 20 minutes ago, it looked like they had closed two lanes. It looks like those lanes have opened up. If you're going to be in that area, just take it slow. All right, you may have heard about how the Texas Biomedical Research Institute was involved in the study of the COVID vaccines. Our case at Explains teams, well, they actually worked on an episode of the show focused on that this year. Texas Biomed is located on the city's west side, not far from Highway 151 and Loop 410. It's been around 80 years, yet many people don't know it exists or better yet what it does. Myra Arthur explains that, plus how COVID changed everything. <laughs> Texas Biomedical Research Institute has had a hand in working on the first Ebola treatment and the first treatment for hepatitis C. We have the ability to handle uh, research and development related to any infectious diseases because we have tremendous history and experience related to what is called biocontainment research. Biocontainment research is done in biosafety labs, labs that are designed to allow scientists to study contagious viruses without releasing those viruses. These labs are ranked biosafety level one through four. BSL-1 is for pathogens that don't really pose a threat. BSL-2 is for human diseases that pose a moderate hazard, like hepatitis viruses. BSL-3 labs are used when dealing with pathogens that may cause serious or potentially lethal disease through inhalation. And then biocontainment level four is the highest level containment, 
where um, we work on infectious agents safely on uh, those agents like Ebola virus that have no current cures. This video shows one of the Institute's researchers preparing to do work at a BSL-4 lab. She's putting on this air-supplied positive pressure suit to take a look at data related to a study on the Ebola virus. There are safety precautions that researchers must take when entering and exiting. The lab has its own ventilation system and airtight doors, and the data stored there cannot be removed. Texas Biomed also has thousands of animals on its campus, more than 2,500 non-human primates and about 5,000 rodents. Those animals played a critical role in the study of the COVID-19 virus and vaccine. Human trials are really good, but before the human trials, you have to make sure something's safe and effective in human, uh, in animals. Uh, so that we know it's going to be safe when we put it into humans. The data collected from the animal studies was used to help prove that the mRNA vaccines were safe enough to be used in human clinical trials. The mRNA vaccines have been in development for a long time and for other infections. So then they're, they're not new to science. I think they're new to the public. Researchers here say the effectiveness of those vaccines and the collaboration that led to their development could be a game changer for the treatment of other outbreaks and diseases. I think the future uh, will be a very different type of vision from my perspective where organizations like Texas Biomed can participate in a much more proactive, sustainable way to help avert these pandemics, which will occur again. Uh, in the future. To check out this or any episode of KSAT Explains On Demand, go to ksat.com slash explains or scan the QR code you see on your screen. Look for brand new episodes after the new year. Well, if you're looking for healthy and affordable food options as Hollywood see Holly holiday season, there's a food truck that you can, you might want to check out. So the San Antonio Food Bank's Mobile Mercado, it is bringing families in food desert areas access to locally grown produce and other healthy foods. And the best part is it's at an affordable price. Tiffany Huertas joins us live from the Mobile Mercado with more on this unique program. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning, Max and Sarah. This is so fun. Like you can get one of these bags, fill it up with fruits and vegetables and it's free. And this mobile unit travels to different parts of the city. And right now we're at University Health System. And to talk a little bit about this program is Monica with the Food Bank. Good morning. Talk to us about this unique program and this food truck. So the Momo Mercado's main goal is to fight food insecurity in the community of San Antonio. So our goal is to increase access to fruits and vegetables um, for free. And we also try to offer low cost pantry items that they can purchase while visiting us here at the Momo Mercado. And each of the, the items have a description. Can you talk to us about that? So each one of the items that we have here has the name and it also has information about how it tastes how it's cooked and what it's healthy for and what, what kind of, what it targets. And at any time there could be a nutritionist or a chef here on site to talk to people in the community about that? Yes, so we always have a nutrition educator on site at all of our mobile mercados. And what they do is provide nutrition education, information and recipes so that people in the community know how to cook their, the fruits and vegetables that they're getting today. We talk about some unique fruits and vegetables sometimes that we don't really know how to use. Um, can you talk to us about some of the ones that you all get questions about? So some of the main ones that we get questions about might be something different like pomegranates or parsnips or um, our farm is growing Swiss chard right now. So those are, are common things that they maybe don't use often. So um, our educator is here to help them think of different recipes and how to use them. What is the goal of this food truck? Um, the goal of the food truck is to increase people's fruit and vegetable intake and to make access to getting fruits and vegetables easier. Um, we want everybody to have the opportunity to eat healthy. So we try to extend our reach throughout the whole community so that they can be able to incorporate all of these fruits and vegetables into their meals on a daily basis. Awesome. So you all travel to different places around the city. Talk to us about where can people go to find out more information? So they can go onto the San Antonio Food Bank website. Um, we update our monthly calendar there. Um, we have the one for January, or they can visit us here every Tuesday at the Robert B. Green location. We always have our calendars here, um, and we can give them any up-to-date information as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank morning. You. This is just so fun, and I mean, who doesn't love 
fruits and vegetables, and especially during the holiday season, you have to mix it up. It can't all just be, you know, tamales. You know, you got to mix it up a little bit. <laughs> Back to you guys in the studio. <laughs> Tiffany, thank you so much. <laughs> Time now is 941, 68 degrees out. I love tamales. Of course, we all I do. I know. Okay, how the entertainment industry stayed alive in 2021 while the pandemic bared down. Good morning and welcome back. In too many ways, 2021 often seems like a replay of 2020, and that did not exclude the entertainment world. Celebrities testing positive for COVID, audiences streaming movies at home and shows at home, but Hollywood did change in 2021 for better and worse. David Daniel looks at the year in entertainment. 2021 was supposed to be the year movies and audiences returned to theaters, and it was, sort of. No Time to Die, one of the first pandemic-delayed films in early 2020, finally debuted in October 2021, while Black Widow debuted in theaters and streaming. Both were among the year's top-grossing films, but with ticket sales far below pre-pandemic blockbusters. In a survey of pre-pandemic moviegoers, some of those still staying away cited safety and price concerns. Safety on movie sets became a hot topic in October, after an accidental shooting on the set of the indie film Rust killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins. As the investigation into the tragedy began, Dwayne Johnson and others declared their intentions to ban real guns from future film sets. I'm extremely fortunate to be able to do what I love for a living. Chloe Zhao became the first woman of color to win the Best Director Oscar for Nomadland, then leaped to the Marvel Cinematic Universe with Eternals. Lin-Manuel Miranda also had a good year. His first Broadway hit, In the Heights, reached theaters. He voiced the title character in Vivo and wrote original songs for that film and for Encanto and made his feature directorial debut with Tick, Tick, Boom. On the small screen, the South Korean survival drama Squid Game had audiences buzzing, as did Mike Richards, who won the job of hosting Jeopardy, then lost that gig and his executive producer job amid controversies which began over his having been named in multiple discrimination lawsuits at another game show. Richards has said the complaints in the suits do not reflect the reality of who I am or how we worked together. It calls to me. Tony Bennett's family revealed the legendary singer has been living with Alzheimer's disease. He marked his 95th birthday by joining Lady Gaga on stage for what his family said would be his final performances. Love was in the air in 2021 for singers and The Voice judges Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton, who tied the knot six years after meeting on that show. And for Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, who got back together nearly 20 years after Benifer first set the gossip columns ablaze. I was so excited. And it was a big year for Britney Spears. The singer spoke out for the first time about her court-ordered conservatorship, calling it abusive and declaring, I just want my life back. In November, a judge terminated the conservatorship, which had lasted for 13 years. And a few weeks later, Spears celebrated her 40th birthday. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. It has been a year. <laughs> it's, it's been one. Earlier, I didn't know the difference between 2020 and 2022. 20, 20, no, 20. it's, it was, I saw a meme online. It was like 2022, like T-O-R. Yeah. yeah. Yep. There it's we go. No. Okay. It's, it's right. going to be good. It's going to be a good one. Guys. Yeah, it's going to be uh, <laughs> cautious optimism. Okay. But one thing that will be happening in 2022, possibly the first San Antonio freeze of the year. Yes, that is on the horizon. That's toward the end of the planning forecast. And it's something we'll be keeping a very close eye on. But we've got a big event that we are hosting tomorrow, the Alamo Bowl. So I want to oh. touch on that forecast really quickly. Uh, I want to show you our, our visiting teams. I want to show you what their weather is like at their home places, states right now. Uh, in Norman, Oklahoma, it's 57 there. Um, about 10 degrees cooler than it is here. And up in Eugene, Oregon, it has been cold. 33 there now, so just a touch above freezing. And they've had a lot of snow and winter weather over the past couple of days. So uh, maybe the ducks are happy to have flown south. Look at those. Just look. It's all just coming together. They're not that even was paying cute, attention. Katie. They're not even <laughs> listening. Um, so looking ahead to our weather I for tomorrow. Go. Yeah, I still haven't fixed the O. If you were with us yesterday, this is just a, a typed O because we didn't have the logo. But um, anyway, <laughs> a little less humid tomorrow evening 
and we'll talk about that forecast shortly. Temperature 60s, mostly clear skies. Northeast winds will be light, so really not too shabby weather for the Alamo Bowl uh, tomorrow. Dew points. Let's uh, let's talk about our dew points here. There, they will be fluctuating a bit um, over the next couple days, more so this weekend behind our strong cold front. So last half hour we talked about a dry line that will be stalling over the area late tomorrow into Thursday. That's why it won't be quite so muggy for the Alamo Bowl tomorrow evening and we'll catch a bit of a break with humidity into Thursday. But by New Year's Eve, humidity will shoot right back up Friday overall, even into the evening hours. Looks like um, an, another unseasonably warm and humid day. Then dew points start to fall Saturday, but they really tank Sunday and early next week in the teens um, behind the strong front that we are expecting this weekend. 68 now at the airport, 72 in Pleasanton. We've got a good amount of cloud cover out there, just like the past few days. Low clouds will gradually clear out as we get into the afternoon, and that will help to boost our high temperatures for a lot of us to near 80. Those that see more sun sooner could easily top out mid to upper 80s today. Humid throughout the day with the south wind, 5 to 15 miles per hour. So let's talk more about the strong cold front because um, I know folks that are tired of the warmth will be awaiting this front uh, as we get closer to the start of the new year. So as we get through the end of the work week, we don't see really a change in our air mass. So our afternoon highs will continue to be near 80. Finally, the jet stream will be able to kind of break a bit, drop some of this colder air that's off in Canada farther south, and that's when our air mass will change and we'll see the big cool down. So a look at New Year's weekend. We've got New Year's Eve Friday. Warm and humid even into the overnight hours. Saturday will also be able to top out near 80 before the front arrives in the evening. And then look at this starting near 40 Sunday, only warming into the mid 50s Sunday afternoon. And then with light winds Sunday night into early Monday, that's where we have the potential for our first freeze in San Antonio. No, it hasn't happened yet. It's happened across the hill country, but not at the airport just yet. So we're keeping a close eye on that amongst other things in the week ahead and we will be right back. Coming up tomorrow on GMSA, our If These Walls Could Talk series continues with a story about an artistic tribute to our San Antonio Spurs. All right, so we only have a few moments left in the show, but we wanted to show you a video. Can we pull the video? Here we I go. I love this video. All right, a Hail Mary moment met with pure joy. Kathleen Fitzpatrick, <laughs> a third grade teacher at Holy Trinity School in Georgetown. She threw the basketball <laughs> across the playground. Her students jumped in <laughs> anxiously. And you want to know why? Because they want something. Tell us. Yeah, sir. she promised her students that she would treat them all to hot chocolate if she managed <laughs> to make that Aww. basket. So naturally, they were thrilled about the shot. It was posted to Instagram, but for Fitzpatrick, it wasn't just a lucky basket. She's a former D1 college Aww. basketball player. She played at <laughs> Rutgers, so she actually knew that she was going to make that basket. Uh, <laughs> and I just love the pure joy on all of their faces. Oh my gosh. You know what? It was probably cold over there. Mm -hmm. Had hot chocolate. Who doesn't love hot chocolate? You know, I we can have hot chocolate here. It's 80, but hot <laughs> chocolate away. In the AC. Done deal. <laughs> See you at noon.